going home. Um, what else? Do you remember Donna? What else? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's coming back to me. I should have written it down. Um, on February 6th, we're going to have our all soup felt, and we'll have soup up here before um, you go down to talk about your lessons. That'll be really fun. Um, January 30th is our intro to First and Second Peter. And I know I mentioned that last week, but I'll just mention it again. Be praying about who you might want to invite to join us, to join us that night. And then I just want to show you, back in 2009, um, I was, I had the privilege of being in a core group with Lois, spring 2009. <laughs> and I just want to show you my, my book from that year. Um, because I, I hope this encourages you. Like day five and six of lesson two. <laughs> See all that? And many, many more books look just like this. And, and look, here's the lecture. I came. I still came. I just want to, I just want to encourage you, even if you don't get through your lesson, still come. Um, we've all been there and just you're you're in the word together discussing it and it, you'll you'll reap great benefits still. Just wanted to show everyone. I didn't do the lesson a lot, but I still came when I could, when I was able to. And I just wanted to encourage you all with that, that we love to just have you here. I'm just saying this is awkward. Okay. So, okay, let's open in prayer. Thank you, everyone, for helping me piece those reminders back together. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we're all here this evening. Lord, I pray that as we leave, you keep everyone safe. Lord, I pray for all the unspoken prayers in people's hearts tonight, Lord, and I pray that um, you would just be with each woman in this room, and Lord, as we listen to your word right now, as we dig in a little deeper, pray you open our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so we had another great lesson this past week. I really liked it. It was so practical. The last three weeks have been more theological, um, the first and second chapters of Colossians, Paul gave this struggling young Christian church in Colossae, and, and us as well, Paul gives to us as well, truths that are at the very heart of the gospel, the very heart of our Christian faith, um, that Jesus delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, that our Lord Jesus is both fully God and fully man. That Jesus' saving work was once and for all and is enough to save you and save me. And that he's the real thing. Nothing else is needed. Did anyone else hear that song this week and think about think about that? Oh, yeah. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I hope that's a memory trigger for all of us that Jesus is the real thing. So... After four weeks of foundational bedrock theology, we'll follow Paul as he encourages us now to live in and for Christ. After this grounding in the faith, Paul was really practical with the Colossian church about what this all means. Because Christ is supreme, because Christ is enough, let's live like redeemed and dearly loved children that we are. So, but first I want, to, I want us to think about identity. So I want you to think back to middle school or high school. We were all a little bit awkward, probably, at least I was. Um, and here's a picture of me to prove it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's me? <laughs> I'm the, I, th I still have that t-shirt, that's kind of sad. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the one on the left there. Um, I think I'm like 12 in that picture. So, um, so when we were young in those adolescent years, especially, most of us were trying to figure out who we were and how we fit in. It's an identity question. When you were in middle school or in high school, would you have said that there was a group that you belonged to? Like a group of friends. Um, maybe you were in the athletic or the popular group. Um, or maybe you were called a nerd or a bookworm. <laughs> oh. Or maybe you were funny and everyone enjoyed your quick wit. I think that's my husband. Um, maybe you had it all. Or maybe you had nothing. Um, 
those labels that we had, we either made them for ourselves or we worked hard to get them. Or maybe they were pasted onto us. But they're powerful and sometimes painful. I think I still sometimes wrestle with some of those identity questions, though others have come to mean less to me over time. But you know what? You and I have a new identity. This is our truth tonight from Colossians. We are in Christ, and in Christ, you and I are a new creation. We have a new identity. The lens and the view of ourselves that matters most is not the one that stuck with others stuck us with, or that we've made for ourselves even. If you are in Christ, you have died to everything that tempts or taunts around you. Now your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's um, verses 3 and 4. This is our new reality, our new identity. And because of Christ in us, the hope of glory, we can and we should be changed. As we look to Jesus, we can't help but be changed. And we can cooperate with the Lord in this change by putting off and getting rid of everything connected to that old way of death and by clinging to the cross and one step at a time, living to please him, our audience of one. If we don't cooperate with him, he can and will use other means to get our attention, right? I'm sure we can all attest to that. As one of my friends likes to say, he'll get my attention with a two by four if he needs to. <laughs> Or we can follow him, knowing our identity. We are chosen, holy, and dearly loved. Let's live like it. So that's our, um, that's our outline for tonight. So for Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, we have set our minds, set your minds on things above. Then our second little section, verses 5 through 11, take off the old life of sin. And then the last five verses, six verses, put on the new life of Christ. And tonight's central idea is this. We are chosen, holy, and we love. Let's like it. So in our first section tonight, in verses one through four, Paul hits it hard with the identity question. Paul reminds us of who we are, whose we are, and what we have to look forward to. <coughs> So from the message paraphrase, verses 1 and 2. So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. So this was our memory verse this week. Seek the things that are above. Set your minds on the things that are above. And then the message he says, um, pursue the things over which Christ presides. Um, look up. So often I do feel like I'm shuffling along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of me. For me, this portion when he says look up, it's like like my dad taking my discouraged little girl chin, you saw my 12-year-old chin right there, <laughs> um, and gently, lovingly inviting me to look up. Since we have been raised with Christ, let's lift up our heads. Let's remember whose we are. Another great illustration I came across for this identity in Christ this week is skydiving. Has anyone ever been skydiving? Surely someone. Anyone's bucket list? It's, it's kind of on mine, too. Kind of on mine. Yeah. My uncle's done like 100 dives. I think that's where I'm like, oh, maybe. <laughs> so, so how does the first skydive go? Do, you, um, do they just push you off the plane and say, don't forget to pull the cord? <laughs> Is that how it goes? No, that's not how it goes. <laughs> they physically attach you in tandem, in a tandem suit, to an experienced person, an expert. 
Um, your fate is tied up with theirs. They pull the cord. They stick the landing. You're just along for the ride, basically. So it is with our faith in Christ. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears in glory, so you also will appear with him in glory. It's nothing that you or I do other than to say, Jesus, strap me on. <laughs> I just love this way. Say, I'm jumping with you. So again, from the message, um, your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He is your life. When Christ, your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too, the real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. And that's verses um, three and four from the message. So we just go with Christ. And your life is with Christ in God. And as the ESV puts it, hidden with Christ in God in verse three. And that means it's secure. It's like a safe that's so secure, no burglar could ever break into it. We are so secure in Christ that it should have a profound impact on how we live. This doesn't mean that we won't have troubles. I know everybody else knows that too. Of course we will. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That's John 16, 33. But... In spite of this, we find our ultimate security in God and Christ, and not on things in this earth. We must not build our security and peace of mind on our wealth, for it is passing, on our abilities or our health, which can be taken away, on our good looks, which if we ever had them, are guaranteed to fade. <laughs> we can't build it on our connections with influential people. We can fall from grace like lightning. You can't build security on your ancestry or your national identity, the strength of your state or your government or your armed forces or any number of things. None of these things is bad, but they can't bear the weight of our ultimate confidence. But Christ can. And if you've said yes in, in faith to him, then you are chosen. You are holy and dearly loved. Let's choose to live like it. So let's move on to our second section there, verses 5 to 11. Let's talk about take off the old life of sin. So because we are secure in Christ, our lives should be changed. Christ changed our life. Therefore, it is up to us to change our lifestyle. So change starts with discarding the old, yes. putting something to death, and then secondly, taking off old clothes and putting on new clothes. That's what the image Paul uses to describe this. So we are to put to death the practices of the past. So he starts with behaviors, and then he moves on to attitudes. Paul says, again in the message, paraphrase, I read the message because I assume most of us don't. Otherwise, I only use the ESV. I just like how he words things. It's another way to hear them. So in the message, he says, and that means killing off everything connected with that way of death. Sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like, whenever you feel like it, and grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of God. It's because of this kind of thing that God is about to explode in anger. It wasn't long ago that you were doing all that stuff and not knowing any better. But you know better now. So make sure it's all gone for good. Bad temper, irritability, meanness, profanity, dirty talk. So Paul tells his readers um, that Christ should change us and that we should put to death and kill off those things that are connected with sin. First, Paul specifically calls out sexual sin. Sexual immorality here is the Greek word porneia, which I read in a commentary is a broad general term in Greek for all kinds of illicit sexual behavior. God created sex to be enjoyed by one woman and one man in the confines of marriage. 
Any sexual activity that does not fit that definition is not to be part of a believer's life. Next on the list is impurity, which reminds us that immorality is unclean or dirty and incompatible with the purity of our Savior. Believers are not to be slaves of their lusts or evil desires. When Paul mentions greed, we have a broader, more general kind of sin. The Greek word used here is pleo or pleonexia, and it comes from two Greek roots, a desire to have, that's the ek part at the end, ekin, and the desire to have more, which is pleon, uh, like plethora or plenty. Uh, so greed is internal. It assumes everything exists for our benefit. Paul equates it with idolatry, which sure gets my attention. If we make it our aim to acquire all of the things, all of the things, and satisfy our every desire or ambition, then our aim is too low. We're setting our minds on earthly things rather than things above. And I'll just be real honest and say that this is one I struggle with. When Lincoln and I bought our house, I toyed with the idea of starting a blog and calling it no picket fence. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> that was, that, that's so dark. <laughs> I, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Um, and I don't share that lightly. And I'm not sharing it to lament anything. Um, we have more than enough. Just not the picket fence. <laughs> um, and maybe you're like me. Maybe there's just that one thing that you wish you had in your life and it would be complete. Whatever that might be then you could die happy, so to speak. But, but there's always just one more thing, isn't there? There's always, always just one more thing. Greed is an insatiable master. We want to be mastered by Christ. I want to be renewed in him. I want, I want to want the things that he wants for me. And I know you guys do too. I want to serve the king. I don't want to serve my own worthless and petty thirst for more. I want to remember what Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. <laughs> Who's winning? No, just kidding. It's okay. You're good. So Paul addressed, <laughs> Paul addressed other heart attitudes. And earlier, as Eugene Peterson, and earlier as Eugene Peterson translated them, these are bad temper, irritability, meanness, profanity, and dirty talk. These are the bad attitudes that lead to bad words. Our attitudes and thought patterns can actually become so ingrained that it becomes very difficult to make a positive change. I don't know if anybody else has experienced that. We are so accustomed to these sins, often we no longer feel convicted about them. That, that second list, I don't want to say that they're the acceptable sins, but sometimes we think about them differently than the other list. Um, we don't feel convicted about them anymore. But Paul reminds us to put these off, to drop them like grave clothes and that represent our old selves. We have a new life in Christ, and we must walk in newness of life. We are chosen and holy and dearly loved, and let's, let's live like it. And then our last section that we talked about tonight is to put on our new life in Christ, verses 12 through 17. So because we are alive in Christ, we must seek the things that are above. And because we died with Christ, we must put off the things that belong to the earthly life of past sin. God wants to renew us and make us into the image of his son. And God has chosen you. God has set you apart. He loves you and he's forgiven you. And so we are to put on compassion, put on kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We are to forgive as Christ has forgiven us, that 70 times 7 kind of forgiveness. We are to let Christ's peace rule in our hearts. And we are to be a grateful people. In all we do, we are Christ's ambassadors. And we are to give thanks to God the Father. And Paul encourages us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 
teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And that's verse 16. That's what we're doing here. We're teaching and admonishing each other, learning as we discuss in our groups, um, as we read our commentaries, as we do our lessons at home. So praise be to God, we're, we're doing that. So this is such a beautiful section. And there's so much more that we could say. So I'm just going to say this to you. Let this passage, this second part, the part that you put on, let it dwell in you richly this week. Read it. Read it again. And let's remember who we are. We are chosen, holy, and dearly loved. Will you and I choose to live like it? All right, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much um, for these beautiful words, all these wonderful things we can put on, and just the motivation and the desire to do so, because we want to please you, Lord. We are daughters of the King. Lord, I pray you would empower us with your Holy Spirit to live in a way that pleases you. And I, we know that's ongoing, Lord, and, and we're glad you do too. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for your grace and your love. And please keep everyone safe as they drive home tonight. Amen. Thank you. We'll see you guys next week. Okay. Did you guys hear that? I'll just say that again. Um, the, your doors might be frozen on your cars. If anyone needs help. Um,